thank you all all so much for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale, and I'm not doing it alone. Mi amigo S. Ville Wilson is here. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here on a beautiful April day, a beautiful spring day in North Central Texas. Beautiful. Here at Skeleton Studios. I just got back from the Dallas World Aquarium. In Did you leave Luke there? No, no. He came. He followed me home. Yeah, we had a blast, man. It was a good day. He was out of school still for Easter on Easter break. We had nothing to do. And so he wanted to go to the aquarium. Now, we've been there before. I've yeah. been there. This is probably my sixth time, but I haven't been in about three years. And, you know, they change out some of the animals here and there. If you haven't been and you're coming to downtown Dallas, Texas, go to the Dallas World Aquarium. Don't go to the Dallas Aquarium. The Dallas Aquarium is not very good. The Dallas World Aquarium is much, much better. They got animals there. They got all. They had a thing that looked like the Lorax in the trees. Now, they used to have a big black jaguar. Oh, yeah? They didn't have it. They, they switched oh. him out with like an ocelot. So I was kind of bummed about that. Those but, are pretty cool. But three years ago when I went, they had one sloth. Now they have five. And you can like stand there and pet these things. First of all, they're not real fast. So they can't really get away like, from um, Yeah. How do those, th- how are they even a thing? Like you would have thought every one of them would have been eaten eons ago. The well, fact that they're still there. Well, they, I know they live in their in the trees, but isn't it when they like they mate, they have to come down or something? Isn't that what it is? Man, I because don't know. Because as they talk, when they get lower, like down to the ground, the jaguars just gather them up. Right? Well, no kidding. They move so slow, there's like moss growing on them, too. The, yeah, the only thing I can think of is they just taste god-awful. That's why nothing in the forest messes well, with Well, I've heard they don't smell the best. <clears throat> They don't look like it. They don't look like they smell. But you know what? I think they're awesome. Oh. I do get a kick out of them. I think they're really pretty cool. Yeah, there's a couple different ones, three-toed ones, four-toed ones, yeah. different variations of each. I mean, pretty. And the way they look like they move forward and then back a little bit and then a little further forward, like they're just inching along. Those things are crazy. They had a harpy eagle there that was taller than Luke. Really? I mean, this thing was gigantic. So imagine it could carry off a child. Oh, yeah. And if it just wanted to attack you, like say you were sitting in your tripod one day and it was after, you'd be in a, you'd have a real problem. Can you imagine? No. The damn talons on it is bigger than your hand. No, thanks, man. Where you're just sitting there, next thing you know, it just like snatches your ear off as it flies by. <laughs> Thank God they don't live here. Oh, and why don't they? I don't know. Right. Why don't, why aren't birds native to every place that's got trees, right? That like, is a good question. You can fly there. There has to be some sort of boundary. Before you know it, somebody will start letting them go. Well, That's what will happen. I'm sure we'll get a dozen emails or more telling us why they don't live up here. But oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm glad I, they don't. Here's the thing, too. It looks like all of y'all really enjoyed the interview we did with Josh. Yeah. It was yeah. great, dude. He's a great dude. And if y'all want, again, crazy, creepy stories, especially any kind of werewolf, dogman related, go check him out. That stuff is really, really wild. Yeah, I got a listener story here before we get going yeah. with the show. Check this Let's out. Let's do it. It says, I'm going to start off saying that I'm a huge fan of the podcast. Well, let me start off by saying thank you. And I love everything y'all do. Now, I never knew that encounters, that the encounters I had growing up was something others had experienced also. I always chalked it up to my imagination. As a child was to blame for what I had seen and what had happened to me. To say that when I first listened to one of your many episodes on this subject, that it made the hair on my neck stand up and my heart hit my rear end and bounce into my throat would be an understatement, especially the ones that seemed to be omens for bad times to come. My first encounter happened when I was only around eight or nine. My father was putting new carpet into my brother's and I's rooms, so we had to both sleep in the extra bedroom which was a loft above our living room. I'm making sure to mention this because it was directly across from our parents' bedroom, and knowing that made it to where neither my brother nor I were scared to sleep there. One night, after going to bed, I woke up to the feeling of someone staring at me. I rolled over to see what it was, and in the corner of the room was a shadowy figured man in what seemed like a long duster coat and a wide-brimmed hat. He was completely engulfed in shadow, and I could only make out the coat and hat from the shape of them. I was petrified. The very next day, my parents sat me down and explained that they were getting a divorce. Now, the next encounter happened about six months later. My mother had remarried, and my dad was still living in our family home. It was storming outside one night, and I was in the front room playing my Game Boy. My dad and brother was on the other side of the house watching TV in the living room. I had heard a noise outside and walked over to the window to see what it was. 
Out on our front porch, I could see the same shadowed hat man, coat and all. I was frozen in place. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. Then out of nowhere, this figure just appears right in front of the window and slams its hand on it, leaving me terrified and screaming. My dad came running into the room asking what was wrong, and I told him someone was outside and had smacked the window in order to scare me. Well, my dad goes to the hunting closet and gets the old 12-gauge and heads outside. He doesn't find anyone, no wet footprints on the porch or anything like that, like no one had ever been there at all that evening. The next day, my brother and I went back to our mom's. Now, her new husband had seemed exceptionally nice up until that day. We made it back to their place, and him and my mother started to have a huge fight, screaming, yelling, throwing things. My baby brother started crying, and this man turns to hit him for it. Not spank the boy, but pulled his fist back to hit him, and I stood in his way. So he just beat me instead, then locked us in our room. So that's how things went, and this would go on for the next year or so. Him beating my mom and me until my mother finally left him. I never told my dad what was happening because this horrible man always threatened that he would do the same thing to my little brother if I ever told dad. I was so thankful that we finally left. The final encounter still gives me chills thinking about it. It does this because I had seen him early one morning in the doorway of the front room leading to the kitchen while I was getting ready for school. Everyone was in the kitchen, but only I had seen this being. While he was standing there, he lifted his head where I could make out a sinister-looking smile, and he held up his arm and waved at me. I lost it. I screamed in front of everyone and asked if they had seen this man. Everyone looked at me and said no, that I must have stayed up too late the night before. So I shook it off and headed to school. Later that day, we were at my family's rental property working on gutting one of the units. My mother gets a call from my grandmother saying that our whole house was engulfed in flames and that the fire department was currently there trying to put it out. I will take the time to say that this was the third house that was built on the property in that spot that had burned to the ground. Sometime later, the person who had purchased the property from us experienced the same tragedy and lost their home to a fire as well. The fire department never found any foul play to be involved with all four fires either. Thanks for all y'all do, John. Well, I mean, it's a classic sighting of the hat man. Yeah. But again, it's like a harbinger for bad things to come. Every time John saw it, something really bad happened afterwards. And I think that's interesting, right? That four homes built on the same lot all burned down. Yeah. That's weird. That's very, very strange. I mean, what is the chances of that? One in a million? Yeah, I mean, right? Like, that's crazy. I mean, that's that's. I mean, it sounds story. like it changed the guy. I'm sure. Right? Like, no, I mean, like, the dude got violent. Was he not violent before? Now he's violent towards the mother. and the, so That was the, the new husband. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. The dude, like, something went down. I hope everything in this world bad happens to that guy and that guy alone for beating kids and a wife. Yeah, maybe the shadow or the, yeah, the, the shadow man, the hat man, Darty's taking care of him. Right. You know what? I think that might be something that we don't realize is probably the single most experienced and, like, the single most seen paranormal thing has got to be a shadow being. Yeah, for most people. That's I think it's the most I think common more thing. people have seen it and I think more people seen it and don't even realize it. I think that and I also think strange lights in the sky. Oh, yeah. Like I mean yeah. we talk about the really good UFO sightings on the show, but for everyone that I read, there's probably a hundred where people write in and I appreciate you writing in, but it's just a story about seeing a strange object in the sky. And I'm without Having video of it, I mean, just the, the description, you don't know what it is, right? It's a, a, a strange yeah. light. Well, it's I'm, one of those things. There are things in this world that you can't share via video or picture because there's no context. There's no way to see. It's almost something like you have to be there in order to really appreciate sure. it, right? That's, that's what I'm, it's yeah. one of those things. But you're right. I think that those... I just don't know. I think it's one of those things that that is a big thing that's seen by a lot of people and they don't even realize it so much. So it becomes commonplace. Mm -hmm. Look, I got something for you crazy here. You know, the headlines always grab me. This is what I wanted to tell you here, Brad. It says a friend and I were fishing in an evening friendly bass tournament on seven two of 1992. From 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Smith and Sales Reservoir in Smithfield, Rhode Island. The fishing, well, it picked up as soon as the tournament ended, so I convinced my friend to go back out for a little night bite. 
Somewhere around 11 p.m., we were fishing at the end of a peninsula, facing the shore with a dark, empty house on the land. It was very quiet, but I thought a helicopter was coming down in the cove behind the house where we couldn't see it. But no noise. I gestured to my friend, but when the lights dimmed, we excused it as vehicle lights. Must have come down the road and backed away, but we had never seen a vehicle. So we continued fishing towards the shore in plain view of the house when I noticed what looked like children playing with flashlights moving frantically in one of the rooms of the house through the windows. My fishing partner and I decided people must have come home to the house, even though we'd never seen a car or people, and the power must have been turned off in the house. We continued fishing, although we had never seen or heard anyone. There was an abnormally seven-foot-tall human-shaped figure with the smaller child-sized human-shaped figure with the larger one looking like it was holding a flashlight, looking for frogs and such at the water's edge. The odd thing was the way they were illuminating, almost like glow-in-the-dark. But we dismissed that as the flashlight reflecting off the water back at them just strangely. Just then, we noticed about 15 to 20 glowing-shaped figures all on the shore facing us, all different sizes, and we got freaked out because there was never any noise this whole time, and we were close enough to have heard people walking in the brush near shore. Just as we were getting scared and contemplating leaving, the flashlight, the first big human-like figure was holding, shone directly toward our boat. My partner said, to start the motor and let's get out of here. As I was starting to set the choke and pull the cord of the small five horsepower outboard, the flashlight levitated across about 30 to 40 yards of water as I was keeping half an eye on it and starting the motor. When it turned over and I put it in gear, I looked up and the light was about eight feet above our small boat. I never looked back, and it was a short three-minute ride back to the boat ramp. We hurried, throwing the boat in the van, and got inside the van in shock. All the dogs on the lake were barking loudly, and we had never heard a dog before this. My friend made me promise not to tell anyone, and I haven't. Until now. M. Wow. That is a story. So I mean, that is a, a fish tale, right? Right. So, look— what was this? They just appeared like I like that it's humanoid shaped, but what the heck could that have possibly been? Well, you get these stories from time to time. I mean, from starting in the in the fifties mm-hmm. of people seeing these bizarrely dressed humanoid shaped things. Sometimes they look like the Michelin Man. Sometimes they look like a robot man. Sometimes they look like a pale white glowing Nordique. Yeah, and, and yeah. they're always they're always wearing bizarre outfits like skin tight overalls. There's been lots of strange sightings like in France and in Belgium and places like that, and even in the Spain. I don't know what that is. What, what year did they say this was in the nineties? Ninety two. Yeah, it's wild though. I mean, like the fact that there were so many of them. Like you see one. What was in the house? Right, because that's what they keep talking about. You piece it all together, it makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. This old house, and there was lights in the house, and now there's just a few at the river or the water's edge, and then there's like a whole pile of them. Yeah, that's— It's crazy, right? It reminds me of the Hopkinsville goblins. Remember when they attacked that farmhouse one night? What is it about, like, (laughs) creepy areas along the edge of water? I don't know, but there's a lot of sightings of, like, fishermen near the shore and, like— Sasquatch will throw rocks at them or they'll see something from the boat just by the shore. But I guess it's because everything, whether it's human or animal, comes to the shore to get a drink of water or to look around. People like where land and water meets for whatever. You look around any coastline, yeah, it's filled up, right? Well, I don't know what that is. Also, you think like they're not used to, like we've had you know stories talk about people kayaking rivers and seeing Bigfoot crossing rivers because they don't expect you to be there. It is truly silence. Like if you're just floating in a kayak, you think about it, dude, nobody's going to hear you. Yeah. There's nothing. You're just coasting through time and space. Maybe that's what it is. It's just easier to speak up on the strange or sneak up on the strange things out there from water side. Maybe the aliens were fishing. That's what they were doing. They were. Right. Maybe that's a good honey hole and they were there doing the same thing. A hundred percent. It might have been a good place to fish. He said the bite was picking up and it was at dark. So maybe they were just out there trying to get their limit. They said it was a tournament. So, yeah. right, they're trying to make sure they fit the slot. They're trying to get in there and get and We don't it done. know what it was. Was it Sandy's? Maybe the Sandy's are running. You know, it's 
good crappies always good eating. Like, I don't know what they got going on. Uh, true, true. So I've got one more here I'm going to share with you because I know how much you like. Save it for the outro. Kids. Oh, you want me to save it? Yeah, save okay. it for the outro. I'll save it. And I'll go ahead and let y'all folks jump on the other side of this break. When we get done, we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to be discussing some very strange sightings that take place in and around military bases by military personnel and those that live on the base. Very odd, very unique sightings. I think you're going to enjoy it, folks. Stick with us. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. y'all here we go like i discussed before there are some strange things that seem to revolve around military bases and and just the military folks in general right like if you're involved in the military it's it's almost like it amplifies it right like people see some wild stuff especially around any sort of con conflict there is a lot of that. We've done stories, of course, you know, over World War II, over the, the Civil War, even the Korean War, the Vietnam War, all the wars we've talked about, everything in Afghanistan, all of it in the Middle East, any sort of those battles. There's always strange things that pop up in and around there. I don't know if it's, you know, the rush, whatever it is, it's going on. If it's the madness that pulls it out, I don't know, but there are a lot of documented cases of that. And then there's a lot also that I'm going to discuss with y'all some today of cryptid encounters, like at military bases here in, in the States and other places. It's very strange. It makes you wonder like, why are they showing up to these military bases what are they i mean if we can't find cryptids and, and you know people deep in the back country don't run into them where you would think they would be then what are they doing drawing out and getting closer and closer to the fringes of our civilization if that's what they're doing i don't know it's very strange i believe i've told y'all one and this is one of my favorite stories i don't know why it is i guess because it's more of a mystery than anything else so a year after Pearl Harbor is there. This is a reported story that took place in 1942. In December of 1942, the U.S. radar picked up a plane. And so they were like, what's going on here? And it was coming from the direction of Japan. So, of course, after all this, everybody's a little gun shy. They're like, we're going to scramble two planes. We're going to send them up to intercept this to find out what's going on. So they get there. The two pilots, of course, you know, they take their maneuvers, they flank on either side, they come in on it, they report back, hey, this is a P-40, which, you know, this thing hasn't been used since Pearl Harbor, like, we, do, we don't know, like, this is a Mustang, right, these things, and they're awesome planes, but, like, we don't know what's, what's happening here, this thing's here, but there's bullet holes in the side of this plane, the pilot flying it appears to have blood on his person, they said that it is so beat up that the landing gear is completely messed up. There's no way it could possibly land, you know, properly, I would say, as it's coming in. And that at this point, as they're flying along beside it, looking it all over, the pilot leans up because he's kind of slumped over, bleeding, leans up, waves to the two friendlies, and then the plane starts to nosedive and the plane crashes. So, of course, they're freaked, right? Like, oh, what just happened? So they send all the investigators in. They come down to the plane crash. Wild thing about that whole deal is nothing. There's nothing there. They get to the wreckage. There's no pilot. Nowhere to be seen. None of this. But in the wreckage, they find a diary. And this diary says that this plane flew from an island called Bidano Island, which is 1,300 miles away from this crash in the Pacific Ocean. So it started bringing up a lot of questions, right? They're like, well, first of all, if this pilot truly defended Pearl Harbor, helped, you know, defend it, this whole thing, and was shot down and crashed on this island... Then a year later, how did he get the plane running? 
How did he get it refueled? How did he get everything going? While he's, who shot him up, right, as he's flying? All of these questions were like, none of this works. Absolutely none of this works. Y'all are listening now. Like, the only explanation is a time slip. That's the only way you could explain it. This guy flying flew into something and then reappeared in his reality a mere seconds later. Saw these two fellas on either side, thought, hey, look, I'm safe. I'm, I'm passing out like this is it. At least I know maybe we won. Who knows, right? Who knows what was going through? The, but that's the only explanation. There's no way that this person landed it on an island and then flew it another 1,300 miles like, I don't imagine they had a fuel tank that would allow them a 1,300-mile flight by any means. But that's the tip of the iceberg. That's one of the strange stories, like I said, that come in with this military stuff. There's tales from the Korean War. of uh, There was one where a man was hit with a green light from a UFO, and it completely disabled him. I remember that story. Like, what I mean is, like, when he got home, I don't know if it was cancer. I don't know what it had done to him. But it messed this fella up. Like in a pretty, pretty bad way, which again is one of those things that we we get often, as we've talked about. There was another one, you know, that I remember somebody had sent in, and I did, I'm trying to think what it was. Old, I believe it was called Green Eyes, which come from the Civil War, right? So it's the Battle of uh, Chickamauga, which was on the Georgia Tennessee border, and I believe it was the second most bloodiest battle in the Civil War history in American Civil War. First being, of course, Gettysburg. But the story goes that all of this battlefield, all of the death and the carnage that went down there drew this creature from the darkness. What they claim it is, is a very large, long-haired, green-eyed, deformed, like it's got fangs, its jaw, like slack and deformed jaw. I don't even know what it fits. It doesn't even fit anything that you could, you know, that we've covered. It's it's crazy to think of this, but that this thing was seen during the battle moving along the corpses. So is it a soul collector? Like it doesn't seem to be eating bodies. It didn't seem to be doing anything like that, but it did have these glowing green eyes. Okay, well, that's a story from back in the day, right? Well, no, you jump forward. There's been people since the 70s have seen this thing, had this thing come across the road out of nowhere in and around this battlefield area. People have lost control of their vehicles, all kinds of things that's gone on. Jumped all the way up, like I said, there's there was a park ranger, I believe, in the mid-70s had even talked about having an encounter with this thing that it just literally stepped out of a shadow. That he's going through, there's a shadows in this in the, the woods there, and it was not like he was behind a tree or this thing was behind a tree, neither one. It was just like out of the shadows, this thing appeared, said its hair was long, like flowing, like a woman's beautiful hair, but said that the eyes were a greenish orange, glaring, but said that that they they glowed that it was some sort of like a flash from behind it glow. And, and the dude was like, I didn't know whether to scream. I didn't know whether to do anything. And at this point, another ranger shows up to the site, headlights hit him, and bingo, this thing vanishes right in front of him. That's another of those deals. Strange, right, on a battlefield. Well, that's not really what I'm talking about. As strange as that is, it gets even stranger, all right? This gets pretty wild. So, in 2020, there was a corporal in the U.S. Marines, Corporal Adler. And Corporal Adler was working as a security officer at Quantico in Virginia, doing a nightly patrol, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., okay, all along the west side of this base. And during this break, he went up into the woods. He took a little break, goes up into the woods for a game camera that he had set up. Now, the reason it was set up is that he had used it to see who would come by, okay? I'm sure they have poachers in this area. That's probably a big deal. I know that they have it certain places around, even here, uh, the base in Mineral Wells. That was a problem for the longest time, right? Because it was kind of left abandoned for a while. Wasn't All of it wasn't used as much. And everybody around there that was hunting would just hop the fence, go in there and hunt and do all that stuff. And just treat it because they knew nobody were there, right? Like the odds of running into someone at this point was slim and none. So I'm sure certain parts of military bases that are left undone is probably a normal thing for them to use this. Well, that's what Corporal Adler had done. 
just checking everything around in this whole deal. So it says, going towards the camera, it said, just right off the road, not but four or five foot into the woods, noticed at this point, it's silent. Like, that's weird. There's no noise in here. Huh? Well, like, it's pretty unnerving. I'm a little insecure about this whole thing, right? But we're going for it. So he goes and checks the creek where the camera was and starts checking the card, sitting there on the laptop, just cop, popped down, popped it in, starts looking at it. So within a few minutes of getting there and getting everything set up, Corporal Adler starts to make out the sound of bipedal footsteps. And I know it sounds crazy as we've discussed this, but you can. You can hear the difference in the cadence of walking to know whether that's two legs, four legs, multiple legs, or something shuffling along, right? Different things. But we can pick up that rhythm because we hear it all around us. We hear it when we walk. We hear it when our family walks. We hear it just in general in our towns and cities and where we work and the whole deal. So you forget of how this works. So Corporal Adler says, look, I'm listening and there's bipedal, bipedal footsteps and they're making their way through the forest. So again, he just assumed that it was somebody, right? Like, well, I guess it's somebody else out here. Maybe, you know, coming in, saw me stopped. No big deal. So looking around towards the, the steps, like I'm listening and Adler's looking around, says he sees a white tailed deer step out of the brush. Right? Awesome. So this white tailed deer steps up. That's weird, but it's a really nice looking buck. He said a, at least an eight pointer, maybe a possibly 10 point, right? Said heavy, 150, 170, something like that, even up. Like pretty good sized deer. Like, yeah, it's not bad, right? But what threw him off is he said how this thing went from sounding like a human to seeing a deer. How did it sound like walking on two feet to now he sees this deer? And he said that was the thing that kind of rubbed him in the back of his mind. Like, how did how did I mistake in this? So there's this large oak tree just adjacent to this clearing, right? So Adler says he sees this deer, and as the deer walks over to the tree, then it stood in front of it. And says, for some reason, this thing just snaps. This deer starts bashing its face into the tree. Adler says, I can hear bones cracking and this grunting sound as it just starts banging its head into the tree, he says, in wild rage. He said, I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. I didn't know what was happening. This is what he says. There have been very, very few times in my life that I was frozen in fear, but this was one of them. When something's in pain, it makes sounds, certain sounds. And deer have this dying sound, this grunt, but there's no grunting, Right. There's no sound of something trying to kill itself. There's only the sound of this repeated smashing of bone over and over. So he said, this is extremely unnerving. So he thought, well, maybe this deer is suffering from CWD, right? Like we've talked about chronic wasting disease. It's a neurological illness that affects deer. It also can affect like moose and elk, it, you know, all the, all the, the deer family, everything. Look, it can mess them up. And it's all mostly here in North America where you deal with most of it. So he goes on saying that what happened next made him suspect that it was something else and that this something else was not natural. He says that most animals' retinas reflect back at you. And at this point, I saw no reflection of these retinas. It was weird and it was very odd. But things got even stranger. It says, as this buck finishes smashing its face, it takes a step back stands up on its hind legs, that's when in the clearest voice I have ever heard in my entire life, it says, I know you're there. I felt so freaked out and I was so terrified. This thing doesn't have a working jaw, much less a working voice box. How would it say anything? I felt like I was frozen in time, like someone had stuck me in jello and I couldn't react. Nothing. Frozen. So Corporal Adler, of course, goes on. He's trying to figure out what, it's, what he's seeing. And this is what he says. Every realization and explanation I tried to come up with didn't make any sense. The only thing that I could come up with was that it was a skinwalker. Looking at it feels like something has been here way before anything, like way before we have. And will be here way after we're gone. This thing felt like an original being of this planet. Now, the only thing that he could compare the voice to was what he said was depictions of old Native Americans, deep ancestral voices. It says that I felt like I'd been watching it for hours, but it was probably just five to ten seconds. 
Then it dropped back down on all fours and walked back into the brush. So Corporal Adler drops his laptop in the place, right, and takes off back to the vehicle. And he left. Said a month later, he returned to the spot to finally grab his laptop and pick up his camera. Now, he says that the thing that kind of threw me off about it, after being in the woods exposed to the elements, was my laptop should have been grungy and covered in leaves, but it wasn't. It was like I had just set it down there 20 minutes ago. And while there, he checked the tree where the buck had been, smashing its head into, and says this, the thing that made my stomach absolutely drop is that when I looked down, there were splinters of bone and antler. I picked one of the splinters and felt it in my hand. I was like, well, that's real. It was nice to know I wasn't insane. It was solid evidence. Now, whether it was supernatural or not, I don't really want to be around it. I don't know, and I don't want to know. Now, he never returned to that spot again, it says, and it was still on active duty as a guard at Quantico. So, out around this area sounds like some madness. I love the fact that he abandoned the laptop and that it looked like it was still untouched. That's a really, really odd thing. And that he's also found, but why would it be banging its head into the tree? Right? If it's not CWD, was it a skinwalker trapped? Is it stuck in this form where it doesn't feel pain in this form? It's just trying to get it off. I, again, I go to the D&D ideas of like lycanthropes, right? Or like you see the werewolves when they tear out from the inside out of the human body. Does the human body feel the pain or is it now like wearing it like a suit and you just shake it off? Was that what this deer was trying to do was take off its deer suit, right? Like it was wearing, anybody a men in black fan was wearing an Edgar suit, right? Like that's maybe this skinwalker was wearing a deer suit, right? So it doesn't stop there. We've got another awesome one. This comes from Aberdeen Proven Grounds in Maryland. Get a load of this. It says, in 1977, I was 11 years old, and I lived on the U.S. military base at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, and we lived at the end of the post. There was about a half a mile of woods behind our house that emptied into the Chesapeake Bay Tidal Inlets. And behind my house was a lane, then 30 feet of grass where our garage was. Now, at this point, it was fall, and it was dark after dinner and had to put my bike away in the garage. Now, after I put my bike in, I closed the doors, and as I was closing the padlock, it felt like something crept up behind me. I walked across the lane to the back sidewalk when I saw something move behind an old pile on the wood's edge, right to the right of the garage, about 40 foot away or so. Our back porch light was on, but I couldn't see clearly. But it looked like a tall person was hunched over and then looking at me from the corner of the wood pile. Well, it was about as tall as me, around five foot, so I thought it was this eighth grade boy from down the street who had always teased everyone. He was pretty tall. This whole family was super tall and of Nordic descent. So I yelled, hey, fungi, I won't explain the nickname. I see you and stop trying to scare me. The figure then withdrew into the woods without making any noise, which at this point I thought was very strange. So I turned around, made my way into the house, and I told my brother that someone was behind the wood pile and then slipped off in the woods. So the next morning, we caught the bus at 6 a.m., and we went to private Catholic schools, and they were about an hour away. So the bus pulled out of our loop on the road there onto the main road and had to stop as they were doing some kind of road work. So sitting on the right side of the bus and looking out the window, I could see through an opening into the woods down to the tidal inlet. The inlet's 50 feet away or so. The inlet's shaped like an arrowhead. And I was viewing it from the tip of the arrowhead. And this inlet's probably as large as four or five football fields. At this point, I saw a large upright creature walk down to the center of the inlet with its back to me. It was walking along in the direction of the open bay. I had no doubt about what I was seeing. It looked dark brown, but there was gray-tipped hair all over it. And I viewed the creature for probably 10 seconds. Then the bus began to pull away. I went up to my brother in front and told him what I'd saw, and I believe the woodpile event the night before was related. I saw Fungi the very next day, and he swore he wasn't out the previous evening. Now, for those who think I'm seeing I'm someone in a, or I may have seen someone in a ghillie suit, that's really not possible. Aberdeen Proving Grounds is just that, a proving ground for ballistics and munitions. Heaven only knows what else people aren't 
out hunting, especially around Officer's Row or anything, over these past few years. And that says, I have heard a few stories of people's Bigfoot encounters in Maryland and in Hartford County and all this in Pennsylvania. I have absolutely no interest in searching for these creatures. I cannot help but see their signs. See, I'm a Christian, and I've had a few supernatural events in my life since the age of three. So here we go. A young person living on this place sees it. Now, they don't talk about the distance down to the water. They don't talk about how actually far, like if you're close enough to see gray tips. I'm not saying it wasn't. But I'm not saying it was right. Like that's that's a good distance. We still don't know with that amount of time difference in between. Like there's some odd things, but it is odd that it's on. It's in Aberdeen. I mean, it truly is. You're shooting like big stuff off out there. Why would it be off out there? Of course, I guess you could say if you want to stay away from people, that's the best place to be. Right. Where people can't be. And if you're pretty slick and you can hear them all set up before they start shooting, you know, not to spend your afternoon in that area of the base. I get that, too. But these strange sightings don't just happen to us here in the States. Listen to this one. It says, I am from Romania. And I don't know if you'll read my post. My English is not that good, but I hope someone will read what has happened to me many years ago. This is my story. I was in the Army, and the year was 2003, and it was the end of September. Me and another soldier were guarding a big deserted hangar. We were supposed to make four hours each. Guarding, that is. When one of us was guarding four hours, the other was sleeping. My colleague was on duty, so at this point I was asleep. Suddenly, I'm woken up, like I had a bad dream. I'm sweating. When I looked at my colleague, he's fast asleep snoring. The time's around two in the morning. Well, at 4 a.m., I'm supposed to start my shift. So anyway, I started to try to remember what I was dreaming. Why did I wake up so confused and sweating? And then I heard a noise outside. So I rushed to see what was happening without thinking to wake up my soldier friend. So I look around and at a distance of 30 meters, there was this pack of dogs, which they were from our company who were barking at something behind a small hill. So I rushed in that direction to see what was happening. But when I got close, I heard a growl, and all the dogs, seven of them in total, freaked out and turned and ran away. I stopped walking towards them and wondering about what that could have been. At one moment, I was thinking that I was still dreaming. When two of the dogs come near me, It was what can be called the alpha of male and female dogs of the pack. Their look was like they were in need of help. And honestly, I was thinking of going back to the other soldier, telling him what had happened. But my instinct told me that I needed to find out what that thing was. So I started walking with the two dogs when suddenly I saw it. At about 10 meters in front of me, there was a black mass, like a semicircle, two meters long and one meter high. I stood there baffled for a few seconds. Then I talked, my mind was crazy at that point, with my dogs and said, go, let's see what's over there. And she, the female, girly, like it had understood exactly what I was saying, went to the shadow and started barking, got close barking, real close. After a few seconds, the mass rose up and Gurley turned and ran away as fast as she could, although nothing made contact with her. Nothing touched her. She just broke and ran. Now, this shadow was standing in four feet, or on four feet, like a dog and not a human. It turned around, hopped over a bush in two seconds. It was massive. It looked like a giant hyena. Long front legs and short hind legs with a small tail at the end. The head was also that of a hyena, but all of it was black. After some time, when I stood there wondering what I had just seen, I came to my senses, went back over to the other soldier. I told him what I saw, and he didn't believe me, but he agreed to come with me to search for it. We searched for it together, this time with all the dogs present, but we couldn't find anything. So before we go, we called HQ to inform them of what had happened and of what I had seen. The response was that I had seen a boar, and I needed to just leave it be. After that, me and the other soldier went back to our post, and he went back to sleep, but but I couldn't forget this figure. So I went outside again, 
although all my instincts said not to do this. And again, all the dogs were nowhere to be found, just the alpha male Spike, and he looked worried. But he had had confidence in me, so he tagged along, and we walked about a hundred meters away from the post, just kicking around and playing with rocks. So I would throw some, and then he would bring one back. Everything was normal. The black mass was nowhere to be seen, and maybe it was just my imagination. So I start thinking, and at one point, I threw a rock as far as I could so that Spike would go off in search of it, and I wanted to go back to my post. But then it happened. When I turned back, that thing was there behind me, less than five meters away. Now I could see it more clearly, although it was still a black mass. It was about my height, 1.7 meters, with long ears like a donkey. That was the first thing I noticed. More massive than a dog or a boar, that's for sure. The body, as seen in the dark, from the front, looked like that of a horse. Other than that, I really couldn't see any characteristics. No teeth, no eyes. I was like in a trance, trying to communicate with this thing. It, it was unreal what was happening. And I still said to myself, this is only your imagination. And then Spike came back, and he stood there beside me, looking at this thing like he didn't know what that was or what he should do. Then I don't know what came over me, but I shouted as strong as I could at it, and it simply vanished. Thanks, OF. So there it is, a giant black donkey-eared hyena that can just spectrally appear. What on earth could that be, right? And why is it monkeying around there on a Romanian military base? What possibly could any of that be? I don't, dude, it's the craziest idea, right? Insane. Well, it doesn't stop there, folks. Listen to this one. Bigfoot gets into a little trouble here on this one. It says, my name is Fran, and I live in Springfield, Massachusetts. And in May of 1973, I was a Marine. hoo We did a battalion-sized exercise in an area of California known as Casey Springs. Now, we were told that there were no roads to get there, so we were inserted by helicopter. I was sent out on a midnight ambush with 15 other Marines, and it's a computerized war game. It worked on the computer, and so that they could send Marines out to see if it could be feasibly done. What we did was we were going after an aggressor force, so we set up a linear-shaped ambush, shaped like an L, and when your victims walk into it, it's a computer kill. Well, we set up this ambush at midnight, and we had two large individuals walk into our ambush, and we opened fire with blanks. As it turns out, we thought, well, that we're shooting bear, but they were upright, so we scrambled shooting our blanks at these individuals, and they separated. One went one way, the other went the other. We got back with our PPB, which is our platoon-sized patrol base, and we told our lieutenant what happened. He radioed it into our commander. This was the first night of a four-day war game, and it was canceled. We were given orders to light a large fire, get a fixed bayonet, and stand on a 360 around our blazing fire. Although that night we heard high-pitched sounds, the only way I can describe it was that of a death call of something human-like, not a bear, and in the morning we had two helicopters come in with base game wardens and some other fellas. And to this day, I don't know who they were. Now, we were made to bring them back to the area where this had happened. Two of the individuals walked where we directed them, and we were ordered to leave the area. And this is something that the Marine Corps does not do. To cancel a computerized war game. There were over 3,000 Marines involved, the logistics and the money that was spent on this, and it was just canceled. So one evening, one thing and two upright humanoid figures walk in to get shot with blanks, mind you, and they cancel the whole four-day training exercise. So it makes me always wonder, do they know more about Bigfoot or more about these things than they're letting on, right? Everybody listening, screaming, yes. It does seem that way after all the stories that we've discussed, all the things that we've covered. It does seem like there's a lot more to it than just luck, right, that they know about this. But I'm going to leave you with one 
more. I think you're going to enjoy this one. I know I did. It says, my sighting happened in the early 1980s. I was 13 years old. Sunny fall afternoon in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Haven Woods, which is on a military base. Now, back then, you could get into the woods. There was a BMX track out there. And me and my best friend went out there looking for our friends. Well, my bike had a flat tire, so we walked out there. As we got closer to the track, we could hear our friends. When we got to it, everyone was gone. So we started to walk back the way we came. And as we walked, you could hear something walking with us in the woods. So we yelled out, who's out there? No answer. So we just continued walking. Now, the sound was in front of us, walking on the trail. But we could see nothing. So we yelled again, who's out there? No answer again. Kept walking. Now the sound's on the other side of us. You can hear and sense something walking with us, but it's invisible to the eye. At this point now, I'm afraid. We turned back around, started to walk back towards the track, and again, in front of this direction, the same thing. Now I'm really frightened. I knew the railroad tracks were to my left, so I said to my buddy, let's go to the tracks and get the hell out of here. I turn, and ten feet from me, standing on its hind legs next to a tree, is a creature I've never seen. It's eight to ten feet tall, very dark, It's well-built, and it's a wolf. It's staring at us with its mouth open, like I'm its prey. I just froze. I thought I screamed, really, but I know nothing came out. Now, this felt like five minutes of pure agony, but it was only seconds. We were both frozen. This thing looked at me like it was staring into my soul. I couldn't move. I regained some small bit of composure, and we ran like the wind, to a business just outside the woods. Hammering on the glass door, which was locked. It was a Sunday afternoon and they were closed. So again, we ran like the wind back to my home through a creek. So I told my mother, but she told me that I had just seen a dog or someone was trying to scare us. The thing is, in every direction we turned, it was walking with us completely unseen until it wanted to be seen. And this was a sunny afternoon. Now, I believe in the supernatural ever since then. I've been in those woods plenty of times after that. I've never seen anything like it. Now, granted, it took me years to go back out there. See, back in the day, there was a prisoner of war camp there in the 40s and a missile site from the 50s and 60s. Now, I know there are a lot of tunnels out there, but the government filled them in and flooded them. So I guess there would be plenty of spaces for this thing to live underground. Anybody else in the area have an experience like this? This thing was invisibly tracking us until it wanted to be seen. I feel lucky to have lived through this. To me, the closest thing to what it looked like was the werewolf in American Werewolf in London. Thanks, T. Right, there you go. Some really, really unnerving, strange stories in and around military bases. Folks, for all of y'all that have served, thank you so very, very much. Absolutely. If you have any kind of wild, wacky, crazy stories, send them to us. We want to hear more of the wild military stuff. I don't understand why it draws it to it, but like I pointed out, it does feel like at times... They know more about these cryptids than they've let on. Which yeah, man. I wouldn't be surprised, right? I wouldn't be surprised if they did. It's almost like the dark energy of war sometimes draws these things. I know mm. some of my favorite stories are like the ones from like World War One, where they were seeing the Black Phantom Devil Dog. Oh, yeah. And the guys were locked down in the trench warfare. I also like the sightings of like the Japanese soldiers in World War Two on an island seeing these pterodactyls and That's one of my all-time stuff. favorites, I mean, right? I don't know that it's real. I hope it's real because it's just a cool ass story. When they said they were like flamethrowing caves and pterodactyls would come out of it and all that stuff down there in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, and you're like, what's the one in Russia where they had the freaking, the Russian soldiers saw a cave and the Almosti were living in the caves. I just, I love those stories. I don't know what it is. Well, I mean, even the original, like you, the Foo Fighters, I mean, that was during World War II, right? The pilots 
Why does it feel so believable to think about it like back at the turn of the century or something in the woods and it's in a cave? Like I don't know. It just does. Yeah, it just, right? I don't understand that it just does. So look. Just I've like you to, were talking about earlier about before we started recording, you were talking yeah. about Romania, right? And I was like, why does it just seem like if it's a scary story and it took Dude. place in Romania, it seems believable. It does. I it, don't know why. Is it because we're conditioned by like old vampire movies? You know, I would agree. So yeah. you think that, you know. What's some of the best movies ever that ever came out? We're like, you know, what, what Jim Cotta, uh, oh, now Dracula, you're talking, you know, like Jim Cotta action. Yeah. Boy, that, that's a, that's a deep pull you just drug out right there. I remember as a child thinking that was really good fighting, but then you look at it now, boy, that movie does not hold up. It's basically, they took a bunch of guys that never made it on the men's, uh, Olympic gymnastics team and then just put the implements out and allowed them to fight. Like there's a guy doing a rings routine. There's giving a high bar, the pommel horse floor. Routine. That's the all it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The concept is great. It's like, it's like an international tournament of the, the most, the, the best men on the planet. They show up and they have to do this like marathon race, but along the way, you're you fighting gotta, for your life. You got to run through these small villages and towns like in Romania and stuff, right? And there's people trying to kill you. So it's kind of like surviving the game. <clears throat> kind of. Kind of with ice tea. Is that what? Is he in that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was the other guy? Uh, Gary Busey. Rutger Hauer. Wasn't he in there? One of those? Yes. It's kind of like that, but then also like a blood sport type tournament. I mean, it's really hokey. Speaking about a movie that doesn't hold up, whew, that's it's on HBO movie. right now. That's a bad like like Cyborg. We talked about you know, that one. Ugh, so rough. Do you think it's because of the oversaturation of like the UFC and things like that? Because I try to show my kids those movies. I might have talked to them about this before when they were younger, like Kickboxer, Bloodsport. They just laughed. Cyborg, all the movies that we like to watch, Out for Justice, you know, all those things when we were kids. They think it's a complete joke. They're like, "Are you serious?" And I'm like, "Dude, when I was 13." This was the greatest thing going. Yeah, I think it's like that with with every generation. I think every generation to the 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 younger kids, it looks ridiculous. But then some of the movies, like Commando, is a joke. But then the same actor does a uh, Predator. It's amazing. Yeah, like that movie still holds up. Dude, I love Predator. Who doesn't? Yeah, but Commando is. But you know what? He's got the best one liners in oh, the whole. Thing, still right? does. Right. Stick around. Hey Bennett, let off some steam, Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, I love tell, it. Now, before we got into the segment, <laughs> yeah, you were going to drop some oh, kind yeah, of yeah, black, yeah, eyed black eyed kid story or something. So lay that on. So here we go. Listen to this stuff. It talks about a Minnesota residents encounter with two black eyed kids. Now, and this gets even wilder here. So this may lead into some other stuff too. It says, "I just read one of the black eyed kid stories, and I thought I would like to share an experience I had." One evening during the summer of 2019, I went outside on my porch to smoke a cigarette. Uh, it was still, uh, that's, there that's we go, right? that's, there's one. That's right. Right? It was still light out. I live near Rochester, Minnesota. There's a small hill directly across the street from my home, and I noticed two kids, a young boy and a girl, walking up the hill. They stopped and looked back at me, but I got a bad feeling about them. They were wearing dark blue vinyl windbreakers with hoods, and as I looked closer, I could see that their eyes were black. Now they started to walk down the hill and come across the street, walking directly towards me. I was cordial and introduced myself to them. They continued to advance towards me. At this point, I'm getting a little scared, so I quickly went back into the house. I asked my wife if she heard me talking to the kids. She heard nothing, so I just put it out of my mind. Well, the evening was quiet, and my wife and I went to bed about 11 p.m. After several minutes of laying in bed, I started to get a strange feeling. I looked towards the window, we have a one-floor ranch-style home, and I saw the girl standing outside the window. Well, I freaked out and went to make sure the doors were locked. When I got to the kitchen door, I could see the boy standing on the back porch. I ran back to my bedroom, and I grabbed my forty-five. <laughs> I just assumed that they were attempting to break in. By that time, I was extremely scared. I went to pick up the telephone to call 911, but the next thing I remember was waking up in bed the next morning, and it was just after 6 a.m. My wife was awake, and she looked at me and said, where did you go last night? I told her I didn't go anywhere. She said that she heard the back door close around midnight and that she went to see what was going on, and she couldn't find me. I told her what had happened, and she thought that I was hiding something from her. I still don't know what happened. I've read about lost time and alien abduction, but I always believed it was all bunk. I still don't really believe it. 
Were these black eyed kids aliens? And by the way, I no longer smoke. I just don't have the urge to smoke at all anymore. Why? I have no idea. But I have smoked for almost 30 years of my life. And now the urge is gone. Thanks, KL. I don't see the problem. Sounds like the black eyed kids helped him out. They got him. Like they got rid of him smoking. Yeah. Terrible habit. Listen, kids, if you're going to miss whoa, curfew, whoa, whoa, if you're, you're going to miss curfew, tell your parents that you ran into some black eyed kids. You don't know what they're talking about. I was home on time. What, what are you talking about? Look, we do not condone opinions of Mr. Filson, <laughs> 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 but just like that missing time. Like what happened? Yeah. You know what happened? Anytime there's missing time like that, right after you see a real bright light or something like that, nothing good has ever happened. Yeah, they would have to. They would be some real warm shell casings in the floor of the kitchen if I had seen something. He like did that. grab his his forty five, so but he, wasn't he didn't messing touch around. it off. No, well, you don't know. He might have done that in another alternate plane. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. He went That'll out there strapped. Up every time though, when that when that forty five starts talking. Well, his wife woke up and saw him go out. So, like, well, no, she heard it. Heard she the heard the door it. and you, never found him. You could tell they've been married for quite a while because if she was newly married, she would have went and looked for him. She was just like, I don't know what he's doing. He's going outside at three yeah. in the morning, right? My wife wouldn't even have got up. Was, she didn't say she got it. She just yeah. was like, oh well, I don't but know. But yours, yours would have been no. like. Psh- I wouldn't even have heard it. This is what mom would say. They'll bring him back. Yeah. That would have been the whole thing. Like, we're done. They'll bring him back. I don't know what it is about these black eyed kid stories. I have, I still feel very strange about them. Knowing what I know, like thinking that maybe it was all made up, right? Like, well, that's the theory is it was started by a reporter yes, in a small news yes. town, small uh, newspaper in a small town in Texas. <clears throat> and I believe that that's where it started. But then it's like, Thought forms where yes. people be, became terrified by the stories, and then it started manifesting, much like Slender Man stories, heck, perhaps even Dog Man stories. I don't know. But now you started hearing stories from long ago, before the guy even ran, made up that story. So it does. I do think that, and it's becoming even more hive mind because everybody is sh- sharing everything with each other on social media. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you tried to explain to your great grandparents, how you know exactly what so and so is doing today? Yeah. How easy it is. How we're all connected. It's almost like a hive mind is easier to accomplish now than it was fifty years ago, right? And so, oh, if yeah. there are a lot of people reading a scary story on, I don't know, creepy pasta, newspaper ad, wherever, and they're thinking about it and they have a nightmare about it. It's like you're planting a seed, and everybody's doing this, and it, it starts to manifest into reality, right? Well, and it also seems to come in waves. Like, we'll get a lot of reports for Dog Man, and then it wanes. And then we'll get a lot of reports of, like, a black-eyed kid. We haven't had a big influx of black-eyed kid reports in quite some time. I'm glad. Oh, I'm not hating, but it is odd. Now, here's the one thing that we do still get reports on all the time. Uh, flying humanoids that are in and around Chicago and O'Hare Airport. Yeah, a lot of that. That stuff on. has still never let up. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I don't either. We've got to get Lon back on to discuss more of that. I still, something's up, right? Like something's up either around O'Hare. I I don't know what's going on. But yeah, that's that flap continues to this day. We just keep getting stuff like that. But like the Black Eyed Kids, we got quite a bit for a while, and then it just kind of quieted down some. It switched to the Dog Man. Yeah, yeah, the Dog Man picked up all the slack. Man, that's... I'm a fan because I like werewolves like we always talk about, but I still don't want to see one. No, absolutely not. I'm well, out on that. If you have any strange sightings you want to share with me and Cam, do not hesitate. You can email the show, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show, 888-393-2783. That's 888-393-BRUD. Let's not forget about our sponsors. HelloFresh, just go to hellofresh.com slash expanded50 and use the code expanded50 for 50% off plus your first buy box ships free that's hello fresh america's number one meal kit and you can also go to lumi labs folks you can check out microdose.com okay go on there use the code expanded you're gonna get free shipping and 30 percent off your first order can't go wrong with that you're gonna get in that groove what do you got going on the rest of the week homie you got anything cool this weekend i don't think oh we're going to trader's village on saturday oh you got to get more of those sega genesis games luke's looking for an original sega genesis yes he is so and he's, uh, he went from the what what did he get before? The he 64? got the Nintendo 64. Now he, he's trying he has to... A, and, and he has a Super Nintendo. But y'all been looking for the Genesis for a hot minute. Yeah, they're hard to find. And when you do find them, the people want like 
ten dollars less than what they were when they were new and you're right, like come you're on like, bro come on, man that was 35 years ago if any of y'all out there have got any sega genesis games or a console for sale just go ahead and hit up mr filson he'll be glad to purchase <laughs> yeah absolutely He's looking for one there i'm going to college station right right, right. i got to go down there my daughter is getting her ring getting ready for all that so we'll be down in college station for a couple days and then we'll be back yep I'm that's getting pretty ready much all the fun for the nhl playoffs are about to kick oh, off baby so that's what i'll be doing this oh weekend. baby we got to go shoot weather's too good we got to either go play some disc golf or shoot our bows and we really should be shooting our bows and we haven't had time to go give a chase to the thunder chickens but we'll have to get a little run around for no, those my, too. my pop-up stands obliterated so i actually need a new one and if i'm gonna buy one i might as well buy a good one so yeah, I just, yours got demolished in it and mine survived well, the Two one, storms. Yeah, but the one you bought it was way better quality <laughs> and probably five times the price. So it was a really reason. expensive, yes. Yeah, so. But and literally, it, it survived two storms in two years. I mean, ripped it off out of the ground, rolled it about 50 yards. Nothing's wrong with it. Yeah. It's excellent. crazy. I don't know how they do it, but hey, they do it and I love it. I hope everybody has a good week out there. Stay safe till next time. That's about all the time we have for this show. I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all.